This is a general disclaimer. Redlands Community College attempts to have the most accurate and up-to-date information listed in its content and delivery. However, your education is your responsibility. Redlands Community College or Roy Smith makes no guarantee in the accuracy of this information in this video and accepts no liability for the informational video. The information expressed is strictly the opinion of the author and the presenter, which is listed in the reference near the end of the video. This information is designed to supplement your own education or initial education and should not be used to replace any current academic program you're enrolled in. View the information and content at your own risk. Thank you. This is going to be Chapter 7, Administration of Drugs, Part 1. Introduction. Drug administration is one of the most important, demanding, and risky functions the EMS professional will perform. EMTs are responsible for the interpretation, evaluation of appropriateness, and administration of the drug order. There are two principal routes to introduce drugs into the body, alimentary and perennial. In EMS, drugs are most often given by perennial routes, as these are much more rapid and generally more predictable. So first thing we're going to talk about here is take good drug histories. Name, strength, daily dose of prescribed drugs, over-the-counter medications, vitamins, herbal medications, folk medicines, and remedies, and allergies. Very simply, you can learn a lot from someone's medical history just by looking at the drugs that they're on. Um, if they're taking an example like a lisinopril and you've never heard of it before, and you look up lisinopril on your device or your drug reference really quickly, and it says it's an ACE inhibitor given to people for hypertension. You could then start asking them about, do you have any hypertension? And sometimes people kind of don't think about the whole, uh, I have hypertension even though I'm on medication, and it's corrected the hypertension. So. Some people will give you an answer along the lines of, well, I don't have hypertension anymore after the lisinopril, but they still have it in their medical history, so please be aware of that. Please take a good allergy. Some people just don't like the side effects that the drugs give them and will copy that or assimilate that information for the actual allergy instead of true allergy. So always be inquisitive whenever you're asking about allergies and what they actually do. If they say they're allergic to it, ask them what it did. If it broke them out in hives and swole their upper airway, then there's a 99.9% .9 chance they're allergic to it. Some people may just may be hypersensitive to the actual medication. Uh, care when administering medications. Uh, no precautions and contraindications of the medication you're given. Use proper technique and precautions. Observe and document drug effects. Keep knowledge. Uh, knowledgeable about the drug and up-to-date, read the most current facts about it, maintain relationship with other healthcare professionals. An example of this, you build a good rapport with the doctors, you can ask them, uh, all, if, like, hey, this new medication we got, you know, the, the more handy your rapport is with them, the better things will be. Understanding pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics. Have current medications, and that would be uh, onset, peak, and duration, and where the actual drug works. And that would be this one here. Uh, have current medication references available in case you need to look something up. Evaluate compliance, dosage, and adverse uh, reactions. If the patient was compliant with the drug, what the actual dosage that you're administering, and if there was any adverse reactions. And consult with the physician when appropriate. Uh, symptoms of anaphylaxis, hives, urticaria, these are going to be like whelps on the skin uh, from, caused from a histamine release. Dyspnea and wheezing from the lower airway from spasm. If the lower airway gets swollen, there's a good chance it's going to have a bronchospasm, which will give you wheezing. Strider from the upper airway and tissue swelling. It's a highly vascular place. If you went systemic with your allergic reaction, there's a good chance that it'll swell. Uh, hypotension from massive vasodilation. Now, this is loss of containment. So at the point that we see this, we have definitely uh, lost any kind of control on our vasomotor centers in our vessels. Very simply, we could um, be very, very hypotensive and low cardiac output is probably what we're going to see with this whenever maso va massive vasodilation occurs. And these are the, the seven R's of drug administration. And these will make common sense as we talk to them. The right drug. Be sure you're giving the right medication. 
there's a lot of drugs that start with A, amiodarone, atropine, adenosine. Be sure you have the correct one, the right amount. Do not overdose the patient. Be sure that you have the right amount and given it to the given it appropriately. So if it's IV, we don't want to squirt it underneath their tongue and give it a sublingual. So right amount, and we're going to talk about that one too here in a second. The right patient. Be sure you're giving it to the right patient. Now in EMS, <clears throat> since we only generally have one patient, that reduces the, the chances of errors. But whenever you're in clinicals and you're working across multiple patients in the emergency room or ICU, be sure you're giving the, the medication that was ordered to the right patient. The right time, uh, whenever you you don't want to be, most of these medications are, are therapeutic. So let me, let me kind of talk about this here for a second. So one dose will be given to them, they'll be therapeutic. This is a therapeutic range that we wanted to get the patient into. And then it'll kind of land off. Well, this whole area here is the therapeutic index. So somewhere in here, we want to redose them again. Now, the point is, is if you wait or you're four to six hours late on a medication, all the time that it took if you were trying to get therapeutic, this time in here, they didn't have any medication in their system. Uh, the right route, um, be sure whenever you give a medication, whether it be PO or IV, be a suppository, sublingual, buccal, what, whatever the case, be sure it's the correct route that was ordered for the medication. The right documentation, an example of this, this doesn't happen much in EMS because we're one-on-one, -on -one, but this can definitely occur at the hospital level. If you do not document that you've given that medication and say it's two o'clock and you're half you're almost done with your shift and you forget to document that that medication has been given at five six o'clock after shift changes they may go back there and look did mr jones or mr smith have his medication so they will look in the in the medical record and there was no documentation so they may give him his medication again if you've already given it without documenting it, very simply, it could have adverse effects. Also, whenever we document, that's a legal document. So be aware that whenever you administer medications and give it to them therapeutically, that you need to keep record of that. Uh, and then the rights of the patient. An uh, example of this, the patient had the right to refuse any drug that's been given to them, or will be given to them. Very simply, as long as the patient has informed consent, that even makes it better. Uh, informed consent kind of protects you. So, sir, I believe you're having a heart attack and this medication here uh, opens up your vascular beds of your coronary arteries and will apply better perfusion or apply better blood supply to your heart. As long as he understands that you think that he's having a heart attack and he may actually die from this, that you've given him informed consent. He can refuse all day long, and you have to abide by it. We can't force anything upon anyone. They have rights. All right, so we talked about all these. So the right drug, one of the most important common medication errors is selecting the wrong medication. Uh, carefully read the labels. There can be several medications with similar sounding names. Don't rely on the color or the shape of the box. Location on the shelf or the drawer. Check the expiration dates on the package, look at the medication, and inspect for discoloration and particles in the fluid. The right amount. Administration of the correct dose is crucial. Errors in dosage occur in either calculating the correct dose or preparing the correct dose. Refer to standard dosing charts, medication labels, reference materials, or other practitioners. Most orders are fairly straightforward and don't, don't make them actually complicated. Check and double check if you're unsure. The right patient. Ensure that the right patient is receiving the right drug. Care must be taken to verify the name of the patient, room number, and if necessary, the bed number within the room. Things to check. Chart, patient ID band, room numbers, bed numbers. Confirm verbally with the patient. You are Mr. John Doe. Right time. Medications must be given when ordered. 
with no delay or desired effect may not be achieved. Important considerations are when the drug is ordered and at what time it is to be given, will it be given more than once, and what rate is it actually ordered at. So this could be in drip form, bolus form, multiple forms on this. The right route. Medications are given to the patient in a multitude of routes. The same medication may be given uh, several different ways. It is the healthcare practitioner's responsibility to know the various routes that a medication can be administered. It is also the practitioner's responsibility uh, to be skilled enough in giving the medication via that route. Examples of the routes that I'm talking about are IV, IM, sub-Q, intradermal, PO, interosseous, NG, and ET. Multiple routes that we're going to talk about in this set. Write documentation. The job is not finished until the paperwork is complete. Completely document all of your care, especially when given any medications, date, time, name of drug, and uh, what dose, what route was used, how much, uh, actions and reactions if the patient had any. Everything is important and must be documented. Do not wait to complete because you'll forget. And last but not least, the rights of the patient. Do not forget the rights of each patient. Patients have the right to refuse some or all treatment. If the patient elects to accept treatment, he or she has the right to be informed as to what the medication is for, how it works, and the side effects. When appropriate, explain which drugs you're giving, why you're giving the drug, and possible side effects that the patient may experience. Remember, they have their right to refuse. If, you, if they do refuse, you need to give them informed consent. Venous access. Uh, it's common practice in the management of most injured and ill patients for EMS professionals to establish an IV line. Size is important. In a trauma patient, we probably want a larger bore needle, a 14 or 16 gauge. In a medical patient, we require a smaller needle. Heart attack victims or people that have a, um, acute myocardial infarctions at a minimum start an 18 gauge. They may have to give them dye, they may have to give them uh, fluid resuscitation, so be sure that you have a large enough bore IV to actually facilitate that. Uh, the type, there's two types of administration sets. There's a macro drip and a micro drip. Very simply, if we look at this administration set here, at the top of this, which this is what goes into the bag, there's going to be a barrel right there. If the barrel is large, it's a macro. If the, it is a needle looking thing, it's going to be a micro. And this is the amount of drops per minute. So most macros are 10 to 15 drops per milliliter, and micros are going to be 60 drops per milliliter. Please look at the the um, skill set video on this as well. Location: the IV should be started in a large vein, uh, generally above the wrist. Avoid starting the IV in the hand, as it's more painful. If the hand's the only thing that you can get, because you can actually see the vein, then by all means start it in the hand. The best vein for IV insertion in the trauma or cardiac arrest patient is the antecubital vein, which will be in the bend of the elbow. Big, large vein. Whenever we start an IV line, be sure that we have body substance isolation. We have all of our fluid, our administration set, have has selected the appropriate size catheter, have a tourniquet, have sterile gauze, all of our equipment that were required before we actually get started. Um, again, please look over the skill set video for this um, for the actual IV start. Blood sampling collection. <clears throat> um, most often to do diagnostic tests, we collect blood samples from the patient. And most of the time, they will draw something called a rainbow. So in your first clinicals, be sure every hospital is a little bit different on that. Be sure that you get um, familiar with what that hospital considers a rainbow. So they draw most of their tests whenever they're starting their IV in case the doctor orders them. Uh, collecting the sample, follow their protocols, uh, complete before administering medicine. After the sample is con collected, ensure proper collection it's in the proper collection tube and proper identification of the samples. Most of the time, the patient will get registered in there, and they'll leave the blood actually in the room with the patient. <clears throat> and whenever the stickers with their name on them are printed off so that they identify them, they'll put all of those on there. 
it's better if the same person that drew the blood actually labels the uh, blood for that patient. Drug administration routes. Uh, alimentary routes, rectal, inhalation routes, and perineal. Now, alimentary canal is going to be anything done by PO, so anything involving the gastric or digestive system. Rectal administration is more along the lines of once it's administered rectally, it goes across the membranes and into the vascular system very quickly. Inhalation administration is we inhale it into the alveolar sacs, and the capillary levels there transfers the medication into the bloodstream. And then perennial routes are going to be through tissue, so IV, IO, IM, sub-Q, interdermal, the farther that we are away from the vascular beds, the longer it will take to actually deliver the medication. Elementary uh, tracks. Uh, PO administration of the drug provides the most convenient, safe, and economical way to get drugs into the body. Although some orally administered drugs are absorbed from the small, from the stomach and colon, most are absorbed from the small intestines. Because they must travel through the mouth, throat, and stomach before entering the bloodstream, the onset of action for oral drugs is slower. The delay in onset sometimes mean a decrease in or lack of therapeutic effects. When a rapid therapeutic effect is required, such as a life-threatening emergency, perennial drugs or IV, IO, IM drugs are administered, administration is preferred. Rectal administration. Rectal administration may be necessary when oral administration is unsuitable. They can have either local or systemic effects. Systemic drug absorption from, the, from rectal administration, however, can be incomplete and unpredictable, especially if the patient is unable to retain the drug for two reasons. The rectal drug administer, administration quickly results in a high concentration of the drug in the circulation. First, the rectum contains a rich network of capillaries. And second, because the venous blood from the lower part of the rectum does not pass through the liver. Drugs absorbed in the rectum are not biotransformed in the liver before reaching other body sites. It may be necessary for unconscious or nauseated patients or small children who are unable to swallow drugs usually not performed in the outer hospital setting. Inhalation administration uh, may involve giving drugs, water vapors, or gases in the lungs. An inhaler may be used to administer the drugs to the lungs. Uh, drugs that utilize an inhaler include bronchial dilators, mucolytics, or expectorants, agents, and steroids. Uh, another inhalation device used during emergencies to administer drugs is called a small volume nebulizer. And this is what we generally use to administer things like albuterol. Small volume nebulizers can has a chamber where the drug is placed, usually two to three milliliters of sterile saline solution. As oxygen is blown by the chamber, the drug is aerosolized and the patient inhales the drugs, which hits the capillary alveolar membranes and then gets pushed across because of the air pressure into the actual uh, capillaries themselves and into the vascular system. Perennial routes. Most of these are what we use in EMS. So sublingual, transdermal, interdermal, subcutaneous, intermuscular, intravenous, transtracheal, interosseous, and the inhalation administration. So sublingual underneath the tongue. Transdermal would be via a patch or a nitro paste. Interdermal, we generally have this for TB test, but this is just underneath the skin and causes a wheel. Subcutaneous is in the fat layer thing to remember to this is to the skin level you want to go at a 45 degree so that you're in the adipose tissue. Intermuscular, 90 degree. Intravenous, please be sure you are patent and inside the vein. Uh, transtracheal would be via the ET tube. Interosseous is going to be via IO needle into the actual bone. Inhalation administration this would be things like nebulization and or meter dose inhalers. So sublingual medication. Sublingual medication administration. Place a pill or indirect spray between the underside of the tongue and the floor of the oral cavity. You may actually have to help people with this. Some people don't have good tongue control. Uh, permits rapid absorption with systematic delivery. An example of this is going to be nitroglycerin. Transdermal. Method of administering a drug by placing the drug in a special gel-like matrix that is applied to the skin. The drug is absorbed through the skin into the bloodstream at a fixed rate. So that means a sustained release. 
Each application can provide medicine for uh, one to several days. Nitroglycerin analgesics are commonly administered through transdermal infusion. Other drug administration techniques, and we're going to talk about these, intradermal, subcutaneous, intramuscular, intravenous bolus, intravenous infusion, transtracheal administration, pulmonary administration, interosseous infusion, external jugular insertion, and epinephrine autoinjector. Intradermal injection. Now, we won't talk about all of these in this part one. We're actually will break into part two here in just a few, in, uh, a few more slides. Uh, intradermal injection. Uh, prepare the equipment 25 to 27 gauge, which is a tiny needle up to one inch long. Insert the needle about 10 to 15 degrees with the bevel up. And what the bevel means is there is the needle itself, whenever we look at it, let's say we blow it up, kind of looks like this. And this is considered here, that angle is considered the bevel. So we want this angle up so that the cutting needle does the best job. Now, as angle, as much of a decrease of angle as you possibly can just to get that bevel to about right here on the needle underneath the skin. Please keep that at a low, low, low angle. I would probably even do it a little bit lower than what he has there. Once you're just underneath the skin, start putting the fluid in there and what it will do is it will make a wheel in this area. Subcutaneous injection. Now, subcutaneous injections can be given anywhere where there's fat. Uh, length of the needle and can we hit the fast tissues is the question you should ask. Promote slow, uh, sustained absorption, which prolongs the drug's effects on the body. Perform by inserting a small needle, one half to five eight inches long, with a gauge of 25 or less, into the fatty tissue above the muscle. No more than two milliliters of medication should be administered in the subcutaneous sites. And the sites that we talk about, now I know that they're on the upper arm there, and any of you that seen a uh, sub-Q know that we don't give it directly in the muscle or anywhere close to the muscle. However, this whole area here, especially on the back of the arm, is awesome. There's generally a good little supply of adipose tissue. And this is where diabetics would be giving their injections. You can give it to the legs. Please remember that a 45 degree angle to the surface of the skin is what's required so that we can get into the adipose tissue. Equipment that we need to prepare on this would be alcohol prep, the medication, a band-aid, needle of appropriate length, and then a syringe that will not um, this is a one mil syringe that should be appropriate since we shouldn't be giving over two mils into the site. Intermuscular injections. We can give them several spots. Again, please look at the skills video on this. Uh, we can give it into the deltoid muscle, the buttocks. Now, on the buttocks, it's very important to remember where we're actually placing our shot. So, if we quadrant up the buttock, top of the ridge of the pelvis, the trochanter on the side, and we quadrant that up. This is our zone right there. Now that's going to be on either side. So again, now we would not like to hit this. So into the muscle, sometimes you see it straight on the leg. At the, on the top of the leg. Uh, this is good technique in children as long as you are in clearly inside the muscle. Now very simply to the surface of, this, of the skin we want to be sure that we are 90 degrees and a little depth perception would be awesome as well. The needle if the bone is lying underneath and the muscle tissue is here we don't want a needle if we accidentally plunge it all the way to the hub that strikes the bone. So a little bit of depth perception, and this will take you a little while to get, would be awesome. 
uh, prepare the equipment. Drug doses of up to 5 mils can be given via the IM route. This requires needles of 21 to 23 and 1 to 1 and a half inches in length, 90 degree angle with a bevel up to the surface of the skin. An intravenous bolus. After we get the IV started, uh, allows direct administration of the drug directly into the bloodstream, either as a bolus or as an infusion. And an infusion means it's continuous. So if we're given a bolus, it's a specific amount of drug that is given to the patient versus an infusion is like a continuous drip. Um, a bolus is a one dose of, an, of a drug injected in the vein all at once. Continuous infusions are controlled uh, introduction at a specific rate of the drug into the bloodstream over a period of time. Now your drug math for meds that you already went over, this would be volume over time whether it be in hours or minutes. Continuous infusion in a way to keep the amount of drug available to the body tissues at a constant level. Uh, most out of hospital emergency drugs are administered by intravenous injection. Drug administration by intravenous bolus yields quick predictable therapeutic concentrations, is the route of choice in most emergency situations, and carries the risk of producing immediate adverse reactions and side effects. So be sure your patient is not allergic to it, and you're going to get your side effects immediately because most of the onset is immediate. This is the end of part one. References for this section are from Beck Pharmacology for AMS Providers, Delmar Learning, and Bledsoe, Pre-Hospital Emergency Pharmacology, 7th edition. And there's several graphics that I used, and they're listed here. If you have any questions, feel free to contact me. My name is Roy Smith, smithart.imsa.net, or 405-219-7613. Thank you.